You guys have both experienced this, as have I, where someone gets, someone on the left in the atheist movement has a mission, has, this is, this is my pet thing. And anybody who doesn't fall completely in line with that gets labeled as if they're an enemy rather than that they're just not as pure an ally as they might be. How do we start, do, or do we start? Do we, do we just allow the divisions to continue, or do we start building bridges and t talking about this issue that what's important to you is important to me too, but it may not be as important to me because I'm dealing with this? I think you put that very well, and I, I, I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's sort of ridiculous in a way that somebody can't see that just because we different m people concentrate on different things, that doesn't mean that we uh, don't think other things important. I mean, exactly the point you've, you've made. There are lots of different issues around which we can, which we can tackle. Some of us are, are interested in one, some of us are interested in the other. We don't have to despise people just because they're preoccupied with a different one from us. But, but I think you're also talking about disagreements in the atheist community. Yeah. So, so I, what, what I'm hearing, or what, what I've noticed in, in, among atheists that concerns me is, is really seems like a, a, the consequence of identity politics on the left bleeding into the atheist community, or, or insofar as the atheist community skews left, it, it inherits a lot of the the, um, the, the, the very liberal and, in, in many cases, regressive convictions of people on the left who think that to criticize Islam is tantamount to racism, say, and they don't really think too clearly about that, or that the only reason why, as an atheist, you could be more concerned about Islam than Anglicanism, say, that, that has to be at some level of an, an expression of your own hostility and xenophobia toward Arabs or, or people yeah, from the Middle East. Yeah, why do you guys hate brown people so much? Exactly. That's, I mean, th this is the sort the of oversimplification. Yeah. I remember it goes back, you know, why do you hate the troops and all, all these other things that were done in a humorous sense, and now they're being done in a serious sense because you, you two aren't as ideologically pure as I am, or you're not as ideologically pure as Sam, you know. But it's not, it's not just a difference of emphasis. It is a... a, a to, to put it charitably, a difference of opinion about what it means to focus on, in this case, on Islam. But I, you know, in my view, it's just it's complete confusion about the, the nature of the focus and and what it is that would cause someone like me or Richard to to be more worried about uh, jihadism than uh, you know what the Scientologists are up to or or um, the Mormons. You shouldn't have said that. Uh, I mean, I'm worried about many things, but I'm worried about some things more than others, and I accept that you might be worried about other things more than others, and they're well, all important. We're also just confused by the label of atheism. That, that, that's why I think atheism is not always the best construct here. But if you are, rather than think of promulgating atheism, just think of opposing dangerous, bad ideas. And and that will of necessity put you in opposition to many, many, many religious ideas, but some religious ideas aren't all that dangerous, or they're not all that well subscribed, or you just you you barely encounter them ever, right? And so then so you can't really prioritize those. I I'm tending to prioritize the ones that are showing up in the news every day and are clearly, absolutely, just there can be no doubt about this, and yet there seems to be doubt everywhere. They're clearly the proximate cause of some of the most horrific human behavior, and it is behavior that would not happen for another reason. I and mean, this is the, another source of confusion. People think that the world is just filled with bad people who would do bad things anyway, and they're just finding religion as a pretext, right? So the, the, you know, the, the Christian scientist who is not giving insulin to her diabetic daughter, you know, would do something equally crazy anyway yeah. without religion. That, there's no reason to think that. And that's, no, that's spot on, absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, 
And by the way, if you guys, we're probably pretty close to maybe bringing the house lights up a little bit and lining up to begin questions as we kind of talk about this. But it, it, what you're saying, I, I agree. It, it would be just like saying that somehow or another, the people who hate homosexuals just managed to all be part of the Westboro right. Baptist Church rather than the Westboro Baptist Church cultivated these ideas. Yes. Uh, somehow or another, you know, the, 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 when we were putting labels on things earlier, it was in the United States. Uh, it's it's not uh, not all Republicans are racists or are white supremacists, mm -hmm. but pretty much all white supremacists align themselves with the Republican Party. So you, it would be silly to think that there's not something there that at least waters these ideas and maybe nourishes them as well. Yeah. And, and the people tell us ad nauseum these are the reasons why they're doing these things. It's not, they're, they're not hiding their motives. So it, it, it takes a heroic act of, of self-deception and, and willful ignorance to say despite everything these people are saying, despite the fact that they can point to the passage in the book yeah. that justifies the behavior, their behavior is coming from some other source entirely that has nothing yeah. to do with, with the, how they're accounted. The suggestion that these are just evil people who will find a way to let their evilness come out, and if it's not religion, it's something else. They're not that evil. They're actually, they're righteous people. They think they're righteous. They think they're doing good. They think they're doing the will of their God. Uh, exactly. And they think they're going to go to heaven for it. They don't think they're evil. Well, well worse than that, they're actually not evil. Yes. Those kids because, because they're just wrong. Yes. Right. And, and <laughs> yeah. quite right. So I, I, th I think we're at the time where we can start lining up for questions, and, and until the lights come up and people start taking their places, uh, I'll kind of ramble on this point just a bit more. And that is that I think we can talk about the origins of religion, but I'm more concerned with how religion spread, which is why what I focus on, I don't necessarily go after a specific religion all the time. And of course, I'll get the email that says, why are you afraid to go after Islam? Screw you, I've made Muslims cry on my show. It's it, at least one. Uh, but I, I want to get to the, to the crux of where these bad ideas are coming from, which is why I'm constantly advocating for skepticism, critical thinking, uh, encouraging humanism. Uh, because if you build the sort of communities that allow people to not feel alone and yet encourage decency and reasonableness, I think you will have a platform that could rival what religions have done because they co-opt families. They not only take people who are fearful of things already, thank you, and give them the sort of uh, belief that they can get rid of their fears, but they actually encourage fictional fears that only they can cure in order to build their sense of community. It's the, the line which I've said many times that people would say, you know, that uh, religion poisons you and then offers you the cure, but I think it's worse than that. Religion convinces you you're poisoned when you're not and then offers you the homeopathic remedy. That's... <laughs> but if we can't get people past the fear, hmm. The one question I get asked, or one of the questions I get asked most frequently is, when you replace religion, when you get rid of religion, if you were to have the fantasy world that you want, Matt, and there's no more rationality, there's no more religion, what do you replace it with in order to give people hope? Science, art, poetry, music, love, sex. <laughs> On that note, especially with sex in the mix there, I, I think we're uh, good to go for questions. And it's, it's still a little difficult for us to, to see folks up here. I'm gonna start uh, on the right, if you could. Questions, by the way. Hey, this is, oh, now I can see. Uh, this is where I get to be like the asshole that I am on the TV show, thank you. And that is, uh, I will hang up on your ass in a heartbeat if I have to. Uh, questions in and a question mark, they don't start with a dissertation or your life story. If you have a question for the full panel, that, yeah. Uh, 
If you have a question for all of us, we will do our best to be succinct. If you have a question for a specific person, just say so. Uh, and please just start with your name. We may not remember it, but we'll try. Please, sir. Hey, I'm David. Hi, David. And uh, my question is for Sam. All right, so my goal is to get you to nuance your opinion on free will. So in each moment, we have a neurophysical chemical moment, uh, you know, which is our, our, our neurons, our, our body, etc., and a moment within consciousness phenomena. Now, there is a kind of next universe canyon between what a neurophysical chemi chemical moment is and what a moment of consciousness is in, in phenomena. So, within consciousness, we experience freedom. For example, I can decide to put my hand to the right instead of to the left. So, well, that, that's where we disagree, uh, but okay. Uh, as you said, you know. Uh, and this is sounding like a dissertation. I will tell uh, you this. Consciousness is the. I, I will tell you this, and then, then you've got to get to a question. Uh, Sam and I are doing three more events over the next couple of months, and free will be, will be something that we at least discuss in private because I, I think I've got a nail in the coffin for this, but okay. get to the question. So Sam, you say consciousness is the only thing we can be sure of. Mm -hmm. So because we have an experience with, with, uh, within consciousness, which is next universe different from a, a neurophysical chemical moment, because we experience freedom in, in, in consciousness, hand here as opposed to there, do we have to take this feeling of freedom seriously? There we go. Okay. Well. This is what's especially seditious about my argument against free will, because most people think we have this experience of freedom, and the trouble is it's very hard to map that onto the, the, the mere causality we see in the universe, and that's, that's the mystery of free will. But when I look closely at my own experience, I don't see evidence of freedom. So, so for instance, my experience of answering this question now, of, of hearing myself speak, like my struggling to get to the end of this sentence and <laughs> my ability to do it or not do it based on the, the neurochemistry, my uncertainty about whether it is yet a grammatically com complete sentence, <laughs> the little stumble you just heard in my mouth uh, on that last Can't word. Forget the sentence. Okay. Uh, no, but decide ev to put your hand no, 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 no. Every, absolutely everything in my experience is compatible with the absence of free will. And if I, if you, to take your example of deciding to move my right hand or my left, I could deliberate about this for a year. <laughs> and if I went back, no matter how many times I went back and forth, and no matter, I could have, I could write a dissertation about why it should be the right, and then at the last second say, fuck it, I'm an existentialist. <laughs> uh, you know. And the, the proximate cause of that most voluntary behavior would in every case be mysterious, subjectively mysterious. It would be pushed to the fore, and I, as the conscious witness of the process, would be a spectator. I would witness the final efficacious product of neurophysiology, and why it was one thing rather than the other, why it came at precisely that moment and not a moment before, why I just said this last sentence and didn't stop 20 seconds ago. All of that is mysterious. But so, no, no, would you... No, 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 you're done. Reality. That's for Julie. Really. Some, someone, well... And consciousness. Th there's a ton yeah. of people in line and we're not going to do a debate. The, I'm gonna the, move this over may to... come up again because this is a, this is a concern of many people. But, and and, but thank and you, you can question. rest easy in the sense that I am a la Dennett, a compatibilist who, who disagrees with Sam and thinks he's actually a compatibilist, he just doesn't know it. But we'll, we'll tackle that some other day. Yes, sir. Hi, this is Armin Navabi from Atheist Republic. Um, hey, hi. I can recognize you. <laughs> um, Sam mentioned that, um, I don't know if he still thinks that, but atheist is a word that shouldn't even exist. Um, just like the word non-golfer. Uh, but if golf was forced, on us, wouldn't it make sense for us to have a word like non-golfer for non-golfers to, to find each other and unite against people that are pushing golf on us? And <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you mentioned, well, we should fight all bad ideas, but some people want to focus on animal rights, some people want to focus on racism, some people want to focus on God. Isn't it, some, you know, if our passion is to fight one bad idea and God is the 
biggest of bad of all bad ideas. Doesn't it make sense for us to have a label, to have the atheist experience, American atheists or atheist republic as ways to find each other and make a movement out of it? Well, it's not that it's a mystery as to why we have the label. I, mean, I, I understand that, it, that people find it, it, it to be a political necessity uh, or might find it to be a political necessity. I, I just don't, and I see a downside to it. And this is a place where I think Richard and I may disagree as a matter of, of strategy or, or tactics. Um, I just see it as ultimately, I mean, yes, yes it, is, it is a shocking fact that not believing in God and being public about that disbelief is a more or less a deal breaker politically, at least in the United States. I, I don't know about in Canada. Uh, that's just, that's totally unacceptable and we should marshal some kind of political response to that because the people who don't believe in God are, it's not an accident, some of the most informed and intelligent people in, in any society uh, because they're just following the evidence. So, so the fact that that's stigmatized is a problem and it's a political problem, but I, I just think you can, you can fight for science, you can fight for evidence, you can fight for reason, you can fight for logical coherence, you can fight for all of these things without ever labeling yourself. And I, I just have this fundamental distrust of identity politics at this point. And I, I don't think we win by, by forming our own identity. Thank you. My name is Barry. Um, this is a question I'm directing at Sam and, and Matt uh, because we've already got a pretty good sense of what Richard thinks of it from his uh, book, Unweaving the Rainbow. Uh, the question is, do you feel that it is inevitable that the humanities will be hostile to the sciences? Uh, and if so, might not, you might not agree with that, but if, <coughs> excuse me, if so, what can be done about it? Why and what can be done about it? I don't, I don't necessarily think that there's any reason to suppose that there's a necessary hostility. Um, I'd like to think that the more we understand the universe, the better information we have across the board, um, that this would improve both the sciences and the humanities. Yeah, I, I mean, there's this famous notion of, of the two cultures that, that is, um, I, I think we're in the process of outgrowing. I think more and more a, a love of science, I mean, now I'm talking among well-educated people who are not being indoctrinated into one or another religious cult, uh, but there's a, a love of science among people who are not themselves scientists is, is more and more contagious. Uh, and it's just a myth. I mean, apart from, I'm sure you can find some scientists who don't care about the rest of culture and, and w w would disparage the humanities. But um, for the most part, scientists are, are, they love art and music and, and fiction as much as anyone else, they just don't love intellectual pretension and scientific ignorance and the marriage of those two. So it's really what postmodernism did to our intellectual lives, where you had some part of every university committed to the idea that there's no such thing as truth. Yeah. And that, that drove a wedge, which, and I, I think we're still recovering from that. But I, I, there's no, there is no boundary between I mean, it just comes down to not pretending to know things you don't know. So, Amen. you know, was, was Shakespeare Francis Bacon? Probably not, but I don't know, right? So it's like, it's, so it's, like it's, it's not, why pretend to know for sure that, that he, he was Francis Bacon when the evidence is, is non-existent? That's a, a question of history. That's a question of, I guess, for scholars of literature. That's a, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's also a question of biology, really. You know, like which ape wrote those plays? Uh, so there is no real boundary between, in my view, between science and valid claims in the humanities and even journalism. I mean, these are just, we're just having a fact-based discussion about the world. And I, I'll, I'll kind of leverage this to go back and add an addendum to your uh, response to Armand, where he had mentioned that you know, why not go after God? Because 
God is the most, the biggest, most pervasive bad idea. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case. It may be that the most pervasive bad idea is that you are a reasonable judge of reality. That may be the foundational, you know, that we all assume that, oh, well, I wasn't fooled by this and I wasn't fooled by that, so I surely am not being fooled by this other thing, and yet we are. Mm -hmm. The second you think you're not being fooled, it's already too late. Yes? Hi, my name is Robin Boostrom, and uh, thrilled to be here tonight. So in your book, uh, Waking Up, Sam, and this question is directed to you, you touched upon the usefulness of psychedelics in introducing people to new avenues of experience. And as our nation prepares to legalize the use of marijuana, what do you think is the, going to be the aggregate benefit in having people introduced to these new experiences from a drug such as marijuana? Uh, well, it could, it could be a terrible mistake. I, uh, I mean, th this is, I should say, I, you know, drug use can go oh, uh, many different ways, right? And it's, it's, not, um, it's not crazy to be concerned about a society that is just using drugs ad libitum you know, of every sort, uh, unconstrained by any prohibition. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to see how we got to prohibition. Now, I think prohibition is the wrong, really always the wrong answer because it has all of these external effects that are terrible. It creates organized crime and black markets and, and junkies who have to, you know, first of all, it creates a total lack of awareness that, there's, that these drugs, that quote drugs, are very different from one another and some are addictive and, and just intrinsically harmful and some aren't addictive and can be incredibly useful. So there's a, we were just misled by this one word, drugs. Uh, so what we should have is a society that, that prioritizes education around just the the pharmacology of, of consciousness and, you know, the, you know, is it good to drink alcohol and, 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 and who shouldn't drink alcohol and how much alcohol is too much and what are the health effects of drinking alcohol regularly and, and that, should, that should extend to everything in our lives and we should have a, just an, again, an honest conversation about what seems, seems good for human beings to be doing and it is it's clear that almost any substance can be misused, and marijuana can definitely be misused. You know, you can, you can smoke too much and do more or less nothing else but smoke, and that's not, you know, that's no, no one's conception of a, a life fully actualized. Uh, so, uh, or at least it shouldn't be. Uh, yeah. So, but I mean, I think, but, but prohibition is a disaster, and it was a disaster for alcohol, as, and we, we we realized that a hundred years ago, and yet we are still struggling to, to learn the same lesson with, with other compounds. So. I expected much more applause uh, when it was mentioned that it, about legalization. And I don't, I don't, oh, no, 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 you're gonna, I just didn't know if you were being polite to the person asked the question, if you're all baked. <laughs> so, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Randy. Um, my question is for Sam. I wanted to know, what role meditation has played in your mental health, I guess. Have you been more resilient to depression or anxiety? Because it seems like you're always kind of being attacked by somebody, either Batman or, on your, or having Charles Murray on your podcast. Because I'm at a point where I'm kind of done with antidepressants, psychotics, mood stabilizers. We'll get there. Um, I just, so I want to try something new. So what's your take on meditation as a mental health like, treatment? Uh, well, I, th I think it is, it can be incredibly useful. I, I think there are certain people who probably shouldn't go on intensive, silent meditation retreats. So I, I think it's, it's not, I wouldn't recommend the most intense experiences of meditation for everybody. And, and there are people who, who, who find, uh, you know, sun going into silence for a week or a month, you know, destabilizing. And that's, and it's a tiny percentage of people, but you should be aware that, that it's possible to have a bad experience doing a lot of meditation. Uh, but no, meditation is, I mean, the kind of meditation I recommend is just learning to pay much more careful attention to what it's like to be you. And when you pay attention, you begin to notice all of the ways in which 
you are suffering unnecessarily. So it is, it, it, there's a very, uh, the universe didn't have to be this way, but it just so happens there is a direct connection between seeing more of what is actually happening in your own mind and ceasing to suffer in, in many of the ways that are, that are unnecessary. And, and so it's, uh, you know, it, it is the, honestly, it is the most important thing I've ever learned, but it's not, it's not necessary to learn most other things, right? It's not, it, it, is, it is kind of orthogonal to almost everything else we care about intellectually, but it's um, in terms of you know, having some kind of, um, I mean, it's, it's not that I don't suffer in all of the ordinary ways I've suffered before I, I, I learned to meditate, but the half-life of suffering, the half-life of, of something like anger or uh, anxiety or embarrassment or fear or whatever, whatever the negative mindset is, it, it's, it's cut way, way down. And, the, and also the, the behavioral consequences of those negative emotions are, are the, the, the door is closed to those. I mean, when you think of the difference between being angry for 10 seconds and then actually letting it go and being angry for an hour, right? It's, it's an enormous difference because in that hour, you can get up to doing all kinds of life deranging things <laughs> on the basis of anger and feel good about doing those things, right? Because, you know, you damn well should be doing those things because you're pissed, right? <laughs> and so, so just, just, shortening the time course of, of all of these negative states is, is an enormous benefit, and, and meditation is, is a great tool for that. Although, although sometimes when I'm angry, that's when I'm most productive. Cause it, it, <laughs> yeah, well, then you can but you I was wondering, sublimate you it. You know, I, I know the question was directed to Sam, but, but just for my curiosity, I don't know, if Richard, have you explored meditation in the way that Sam's talking about at all? I did once, I did once do a course in uh, transcendental meditation. Hmm. I'm sorry to say it did absolutely nothing for me. Well, well it, it uh, on a somber note, I, I would argue that Transcendental Meditation, at least in some sense, killed Doug Henning, which will make me pissed off at Transcendental Meditation, at least until I can meditate to let go. But, yes? Hi, my name is Leah, and I just want to say welcome so much to Sam and Richard, hey, both for hey, coming back you. to Vancouver. Yeah. Um, and I would just say on meditation, Sam recommended that I do a 10-day meditation retreat, and all I can say is it did wonders for my marriage that I was quiet for 10 days. <laughs> so um, my question is future-focused um, and in two parts. Um, so you had me at hello with atheism. You have had me at hello with uh, your book, Waking Up on Consciousness. I very much agree that it just sure looks to be a lot better to focus on how we can actually just be better and nicer and focus on those qualities that are measurable. And I have a question. The first part is, um, what are the biological or societal uh, hurdles or roadblocks that we need to get past in our evolution as humans to do more of that. I already agree that, you know, religion hasn't helped, but what are the other sort of case studies that you can pull up biologically or culturally that we could use to make this faster? And secondly, um, it strikes me that resource, the second part is resource allocation has been a challenge and that's been um, one of the drivers of tribalism is that in the, in the quest for resources, we've not been nice to each other. Given the abundance that we are seeing that technology is creating and sort of the democratization of that abundance, will that solve some of these problems and leapfrog us ahead in evolution? I find your yeah. questions yeah. as long and leading as mine. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, briefly, I mean, there's a, there's a lot there, but I think the, the problem one of the greatest problems we have, and there's an obvious, this connects directly to what, what Richard was saying about evolution, the evolution of tribalism. Uh, we have our, our, our moral, our morality, most people's morality is anchored to social emotions and, and quintessentially moral emotions that are not good guides for living a good life or building a good society. I mean, emotions like disgust, right? I mean, so some people find homosexuality disgusting or the idea of gay sex disgusting. And that is the end of the argument for them, 
right? It's like the, that, is, that, is, that is enough to pass laws on, right? That's enough if you're in a, in, a, a, in a theocracy, that's enough to justify throwing people off the top of buildings. Uh, uh, so, it's, uh, so, so disgust is a very bad guide for, for our you know, uh, you know, morality and, and desire is a bad guide as well. I mean, we have, the, we have the things like lust and disgust and fear and you know, xenophobia, um, which is you know, just fear in, in a certain context. Uh, these are, we have to be able to, to have a, a reasoned conception of the good life, both personally and collectively, that gets beneath these ape-driven, uh, uh, you know, lim limbic arousal argument, non-arguments, which are just, just uh, uh, which are, is, is how all of our moral thinking gets coded psychologically, and that's, that's just, it's a problem. We get, you know, you can see every conversation about a, a charged issue leading people to get moral, emotionally hijacked in the midst of the conversation, and then they're not processing arguments anymore, and so we have to find mechanisms to get around that. And it, I mean, on the final question on, on just resource allocation, one of these moral emotions that, that we have, I mean, if, you, if you imagine a world of real abundance, like a world where you know, we have, we've built the right AI that's just pulling wealth out of the, the atmosphere and no one really has to work anymore, right? Because we, we literally have machines that can build machines that can build machines that are all powered by sunlight that do everything better than we can. Now, why wouldn't that be some kind of utopia? Well, it wouldn't be a utopia because we have these very uh, uh, weird emotions, or many of us do, which tell us, which, which give us an ethics that, that, that make it seem like it would be wrong to spread the wealth around. It would be right, like, we, we, most people are living as though they want to live in a world where there's a few trillionaires living in compounds ringed by razor wire and everyone else is sort of starving to death. You know, it's like a winner-take-all scenario. And so we have to find a new ethic whereby people are no longer, their, their, their purchase on existence is no longer uh, justified by, by doing profitable work that other people will pay them for. I mean, we have, in a world of true abundance, you shouldn't have to work to justify your life. You should be, you should be free to enjoy the wealth of the world. And that's and and if we're going to get to that place, we have to change our ethics around that. Hi, I'm Kumaran. Um, my name is Kumaran. Uh, quick question, uh, mainly to Sam, but I guess it applies to others as well. Uh, you've talked a little bit about how you've gotten some strange bedfellows by some of your views on Islam, for example, have resulted in people that you may not agree with that are essentially just xenophobic sort of following you and becoming sort of part of your fan base or whatever you'd call it. And similarly, you wrote a letter to a couple of feminists a few years ago that got in an argument with you that has been re-quoted pretty extensively by people in sort of the more red pill, kind of crazy men's movement crowd. How do you think about those things in terms of, I, I, can, I know that you don't agree with those actual views espoused there, but you, you know, especially in the world of social media, you start getting yourself you know, it's hard sometimes where they, the tail can wag the dog over time well, if people... I'm embarrassed to say, I don't even remember what you're referring to in terms of the, the letter to feminists. Yeah. Oh, was, it, was this my blog post, I'm not the sexist pig you're looking for? Yes, exactly. That okay. was it. Um, yeah. That was it. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's just, you can't be... If you, if, if you take the time, to, I mean, you, can, you can't fully explain yourself and close the door to every possible misrepresentation of your, your utterances in every single utterance, right? So you, get the, like you, just, you can't condense a book into a paragraph and you can't condense a paragraph into a single sentence every time. I mean, maybe, maybe you can occasionally do it, but it's just, you, if people are determined to take your words out of context in a way that is designed to mislead people as to what they actually meant in context, right? That there is no, there is no way to, to prevent that. I mean, I'm just convinced that it's, it's impossible to prevent that. And I, I can be much more careful than I've been in some, and I am more careful than I was in some of my earlier books now in general, because I'm, I, I'm less interested in 
writing something that's provocative and entertaining, and I'm more interested in not experiencing this, this deluge of, of misrepresentation. So I'm, I'm trying to, to I, I am more careful than I used to be, but it's, it's still impossible. I mean, and so it's, it's not, um, I, I, I can't take it seriously. If somebody creates some meme that completely misrepresents my view and then some Nazi nutcase likes it, uh, I don't know what to do with that, all right? Mm -hmm. wow. So Richard dealt with this with regard to the fleas and your detractors. How much attention do you pay to the people who are saying negative things about you or, or trying to misrepresent what you've said and, versus how much do you let your words stand on their own? Well, Sam is absolutely right, of course, that, that it's, it's extremely um, hard to condense a, pa a paragraph down to 144 words, whatever it is, in the characters. Um, and in, in some cases, misunderstanding with hindsight can be understood. You can see where, where the misunderstanding came from. In other cases, I suspect there's a kind of active searching for the opportunity to misunderstand, um, active searching for offense. I think there are offense junkies who just love to be offended. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Sam that, that, that we have to be, to be careful. You can't rely upon people interpreting your words in the way that you intended them to be inter interpreted. And you, can, you must have to expect that quite a lot of people are going to misunderstand, in some cases possibly even deliberately misunderstand, which is sad. This is why the, the principle of charity is so important. If you actually want to understand somebody's position, then you will always be interested in their efforts to clarify it, right? But what we're noticing in our discourse, politically especially, is people don't want, really want to understand your position. They want to catch you saying something that can be construed uh, in the worst possible way and then hold you to it. And then they claim to understand what you think better than you do, yeah. right? They, they, they pretend to be mind readers. That's among the many things that I, I caution people about is don't pretend you can read people's minds or their motivations. Uh, even those of us who pretend to do it on stage, are, we're just fake and we're not as good at it. I used to toil over this and it would, basically what, I, what I've stopped doing by means of a solution is I pretty much don't read any comments that come in on YouTube. Um, maybe a couple over the first day or so just to make sure I didn't like post a video that didn't have audio or you know the famous my left ear loved this because I didn't you know convert the, the single channel to mono uh, but for me the line's really simple I've stated my position somebody either didn't understand it or found fault with it if there's fault I'll keep going back and forth as long as somebody's making a reasonable case for what they think is wrong with it because that's a debate that's what I do if I've explained it and explained it again, and now it's just getting in the way of me actually getting work done and reaching the people who already understood this and may understood the next five or six things, if it's getting in the way of me learning something from somebody else, if I'm just sitting there spinning my wheels, now it's no longer worth my time because that person may not be reachable at all, but they're clearly not reachable by me right now, so I'm gonna leave it for somebody else because I've got better things to do most of the time. But... Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dan. I'm from Calgary. Um, Sam, I, I find your books, uh, your podcasts, and uh, your talks uh, um, are kind of like a torch of reason um, for civilization uh, in some sense. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to first send our appreciation for that. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, my, my question is to Richard and Sam. Uh, what was it like to stand on stage next to Christopher Hitchens? I suppose he was the most eloquent speaker I ever heard, uh, had a, a magnificent voice which he deployed beautifully, had amazing resources in in terms of memory, in terms of quotations, in terms of historical allusions, um, reading. Uh, I, I once wrote 
if you are invited to have a debate against Christopher Hitchens' decline. Uh, but he was, e even as he was, a ruthless uh, debater. Nevertheless, he was also very courteous, and he would go and have a drink with his victim after slaughtering him. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't agree with him about everything, um, but if you, if you wanted to disagree with him, you better be well prepared with arguments, because he's a very, very hard person to, to argue against. A wonderful gentleman, much missed. Yeah.